Um, and Tayo is going to talk to us about the journey that he's uh, been on with Pagatech. Good morning, everyone. How many people in the room, just by show of hand, um, are running a business that they started? Okay, great. How many of you have raised money from individual investors who are not your friends and family? Or who are not family, at least, okay. Um, how many of you are raised from institutional investors? Okay, fewer. All right, um, are my slides on? Okay, good. Um, how many of you have taken debt from the banks? Okay, there's a few people in the room. Okay, I'm gonna try and skip through the slides a bit, but really today what I wanted to do was build on, on Raphael's conversation um, and share my experience um, and my lessons learned. Um, I think as Ngozi expressed earlier, I think I've actually done all of the above. Um, except for debt, but we're actually looking at that now. Um, and, and I'll just try and share some of my you know, tidbits as we, go, as we go through. But the first thing I want to share with you is this quote from Abraham Lincoln. Um, and, I, and I really take this um, very, very, very strongly as well, is that if you, if you had six hours to cut down a tree, you'll spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. Um, in fact, the number one advice I give most Nigerians I run into who have just graduated university and tell me they want to start a business is no. Go and find a job, go and learn, go and sharpen your skills, right? Um, there's a reason why globally most successful entrepreneurs are in their 40s. And the reason why is that they've actually learned how to manage teams, they've learned how to deal with people issues, they've learned how to give feedback, how to run a P&L, They've learned so many things that end up helping them in driving their business. So if, you, if this is all you took away from my presentation, um, I would be happy actually. Okay, it worked immediately, but now I'm back. All right, there we go. Um, I'm just gonna skip all the slides on Paga. It's what I do, it's what I love. Um, and maybe the only thing I would say about, about it actually is why I do this, because this is actually very important to the rest of my story. Um, I founded Paga in 2009 um, out of my own frustration carrying cash with me in Nigeria um, and, and trying to solve two problems. One is how do people pay for goods and services? Um, if we cannot pay for goods and services, then why are we all here, right? We need to be an efficient way to pay for things. Um, I was at the central bank a few, a few weeks ago um, and I wanted to get lunch and I asked them if there was a POS downstairs and they said, no, take cash. So we, and this is from the department that's responsible for cashless Nigeria, by the way. So we have a long way to go in solving this problem. Um, and, but I say that because I wanted to share with you why I do what I do. Um, and the first thing as an entrepreneur, Yewande had said, and I, and I actually respectfully disagree, she said that entrepreneurs are opportunity seekers. I can see why she said that, but I actually think entrepreneurs are change makers. Really, what are you trying to change? If you're not trying to change something, please stop, right? Everything is fine. Um, if, you, if, you don't, if you think everything is fine, then don't start a business, right? You should be trying to try change something. The uh, unreasonable person is the only one that tries to change something. The reasonable person just goes on, and that's fine. But it's important to know if you want to seek to make change happen, right? You have to be very clear on what you're trying to change and why. Why are you doing it? Um, and this is important because everyone you speak to, whether they are investors, whether they are people you're trying to sell to come onto your team, whether it's customers, they're not buying your product because of what you do, they're doing it because of why you do it. And they have to be able to see why you're passionate. And um, Simon Sinek, who I highly recommend you look for on YouTube, um, really, really good speaker, um, says something, says people do not buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, and that's really what people are buying. People are not on Facebook because Facebook is a social media, it's because they're trying to connect everyone together, right? It's just, it's the why behind the story. Same thing with why I use Google search, 
It's what were they trying to do? Make it easier, bring the information to the world easier. So you have to remember like what is the why behind what you're doing and you always have to, to, sell, to sell that. Um, one of the things I get when I talk to people is what is the relationship between an investor and an entrepreneur? And I think you have to really understand that investors are your partners on the journey, right? Um, when I first started Paga, the first meeting I had was that my uncle decided to introduce me to a friend of his in South Africa. He said, look, this is a Nigerian guy. He's got a lot of money. He'll get this idea. Come down, come and visit him. Um, and I remember jumping on a plane and I went down to South Africa and we had this wonderful dinner. Before the end of dinner, he was screaming, just paga it. I can hear it already on the radio. I was like, wow, this guy got it, right? Um, and here I was, I was thinking, you know, here's, I'm gonna get this guy to invest a million dollars. Two days later, I met him, and he said, let's go and sell this idea to a couple different uh, big names that you'd recognize. And by the way, you'll make money, and you'll still run the business. And I was so deflated. Um, and you know, I went back to my uncle, and he was surprised. And he said something I'd never really considered before. He said, you know, when you hear stories of Google and Yahoo and all these people that started companies out of a garage, he's like, do you think they wanted to start out of a garage? I mean, I'd been in Silicon Valley for, for nine years, and I never considered that. No, who wants to start business out of a garage, right? He's like, you're going to do what it takes to move you forward. And that's what, and that's what we've, pretty much, we've pretty much done. And we've done that with a lot of investors, angel investors, who have helped us along, along that journey. Entrepreneurship is a very lonely road. Um, you know, when they say lonely is the, the head that wears the crown, it's true. Right? Um, a lot of times you cannot share what's going on with everyone around you. And so it's good to have other people who are also carrying that burden with you. And, and I see my investors as partners on, in, making, in making that happen. So I think you should see, you should see them as partners in that, in that journey. Um, I think it's also important for you just to always you know, have that relationship balance very clear. Um, the investors are bringing money. They're bringing corporate governance. Um, they're bringing connections and guidance. You as the entrepreneur, what you're bringing is your passion. You're bringing your time, your energy. Um, ideally, you shouldn't invest in your business. I did, um, and it's not uncommon to have to do that. But the reason why I say that is I think it's good to actually separate out um, the role you play, right? Um, one is as a founder of the business. The other, because of corporate governance, is as a, you know, potentially the person running the business. Um, nobody can take away from you, I say to my staff, nobody can take away from me the fact that I founded Paga. But you know what? I can be fired because if I don't do a good job, there's corporate governance here and my board can fire me, right? So you have to also sort of have that in your mind that if you want to build sustainably, you have to also subject yourself to, to these kinds of corporate governance rules. Um, so think of investors as partners. Let them carry the burden. That means if something goes wrong, tell them as well, right? And let them also help you brainstorm and help you think about what, you know, how to drive the business. So I think there, I mean, I'll just sort of um, lay this out. There are basically four investment stages. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but pretty much seed, series A, series B, and series C. Um, I think for most people who are at the very beginning, you wanna go to friends and family. You've heard that before. Um, after that experience I told you about, um, we essentially went to our friends and family and we passed the hat around. Um, and, and literally, Paga today, we have about 34 angel investors. Yeah, um, It's very difficult to manage 34 people, um, but we, that's what we had to do. Right? We have about six institutions, but we have 34 angel investors. And when I look at, if I were in the US doing this business, for the same amount of money we've raised from that 34, we'll probably have max maybe three, four, right? So we have to recognize in this conversation we're having here today that Nigeria is just at a very different stage of investment when it comes to the venture capital life cycle, right? There are not that many angel investors. There are not that many people coming from wealthy families who can invest in businesses. Um, and a lot of wealthy Nigerians, there's wealth in Nigeria, but a lot of wealthy Nigerians are not yet used to the idea of investing in a seed opportunity, right? 
So we're hoping that changes, and I think a lot of people in the States here are actually working in various ways to try and change these things, um, but it's not yet quite there. And so at the seed and Series A stage, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of room uh, for, for additional, additional capital. Okay, so we've talked about this before. In the seed stage, go to friends and family. Um, one thing we are seeing in uh, Nigeria now is the emergence of angel networks. Um, so angels are people who have seen the idea of investing in other entrepreneurs and helping them get their business to the stage where institutional investors can come in. Um, and, and like I said, in my company, I, I have a lot of different angels in the business. Um, but now these angel networks allow you one place to go to where they have actually pulled together a group of angels. And I, and I give some examples here um, of, of different angel clubs, angel groups that are, are setting up within, within Nigeria. And but my advice is that before you go to the angels, angel clubs, or angel networks, have something that you can actually demonstrate and you can show. So already have a working product, a working service, something that's already generating revenues, because again, you're now going one step removed from people who, people who know you. By the way, that gentleman I told you my story, and I, I actually don't, I, and I see him today and I say hi, I don't actually fault him in any way because he didn't know me, right? I came out of nowhere, he met this guy, and yes, he likes the idea, he saw the opportunity, but he doesn't know me, so how, why would he believe in me to go make it happen? So by the time you get to angels, you have to already have something that they can actually see or the other evidence that they can sh use as a basis to say, yes, you are going to be able to actually execute on this, on this idea. Um, so for institutional investors, the key question is, are you doing something that would be attractive to them? Right? Institutional investors typically want to at least double or three times their money in less than five years. Um, not all businesses are attractive to institutional investors. In fact, I will tell you that there are some businesses you shouldn't look for institutional investors for. I have a friend who runs a business in the U.S. Um, and is one of the fastest growing business in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is like, you know, the heaven of tech. But what he does is he sells artificial Christmas trees, right? He sells artificial Christmas trees. It's not a business invest, institutional investors in the Bay Area would think about investing in. But his business is one of the fastest growing businesses in the Bay Area, right? I mean, he's solving a problem that is a first world problem, right? How do I get a Christmas tree and not deal with cutting down the tree? I mean, that, that's not the problem we want to solve in Nigeria right now, right? But that's a problem that is actually works there. People are paying $1,000 for a nice Christmas tree, you know? Um, so not all businesses are, are for institutional investors. But if you're going to find institutional investors, you should focus on those who are passionate about the problem you're trying to solve. Um, because you also want them to be in for the long term, and you don't want them to get tired about it, etc. You want them to be passionate about what you're doing, but also diligence them. The same way they're diligencing you, you should also diligence them and ask to speak to CEOs of other companies they've invested in, Try and understand their track record, what they're doing. It's a two-way game. I say it's actually like dating. When you're fundraising, it's really like dating. The first time you go on that date, don't try to kiss the girl, guys, right? You just try to poop, you know, be cool about it all. The next day, don't even call her back, right? And then the third day, maybe you call her. You know, you know, you, we, we know the games we play, right? It's exactly the same thing when you're fundraising. Don't ask for money, right? Ask for advice, right? Go and ask for advice. Continue getting people to... Actually, you know, and I didn't know this when I started, but when I actually look at the people who invested in my business um, and, and have a very good example in this room, you know, when I look back at it, I didn't know this person before, but I actually spent a lot of time just picking this person's brain, right? And just picking her brain and, and saying, wow, I was actually getting a lot of value just from just sort of engaging. And by the time I started raising money, she was one of the first people I wanted to invest because, you know, she'd already been you know, already engaged in helping me build this thing, so it made sense. So I don't say you should, you know, you, you can't plan all these things, but just sort of think about that as you, as you go about it. And it's definitely a marriage. It's a long-term game. So this mean, has a lot of implications. It means that you should be fair all the time, right? It's a long-term game. You always be fair and always do what's right um, and always put that ahead, right? So you never know how your investors come to help you down the line. 
So what are my lessons? Um, I'll just sort of click through them and I'll talk about it. The first one is no financing deal is closed until the cash is in the bank, yeah? Um, don't ever think, oh, I've raised, oh, someone says they're interested. The first person that said they were going to invest in Paga, it took them about eight months before they invested, yeah? And I remember being very excited um, and I'd already, by the time they actually put their money in, I already had a lot of other people in. Um, pass the hat around widely, you know? A lot of my friends actually gave me a lot of grief for not asking them because I didn't think, oh, I didn't think they had that much money, you know? Don't estimate how much people can invest. One of the largest investors in our business today, I, if you told me he could invest what he did, I would have told you no, I, I didn't think so, right? Always share with people why you're doing what you're doing. Another one of our largest investors came out of me sharing with a former classmate of mine what I was doing in Nigeria. At the end of the conversation, she was like, oh, do, can I introduce this to X person? And I was like, sure. I mean, this guy has never been to Nigeria, anything, and in less than a few months, you know, he wrote us the largest check we had gotten at the time. So, you know, you just never know who can be, who can introduce you. But in each stage of your business, be thoughtful about what you want out of investor, what type of investors you want, uh, but always be selling. I always say to people, I'm always fundraising. So if any of you have money, please reach out to me. Um, but Nigeria right now, unfortunately for all of us, is not the top investment destination. A lot of things that Bismarck talked about are real, right? Investors are not necessarily looking at Nigeria because of what's going on with the Naira, what's going on with, the oil, with oil. We need to diversify our economy, etc. So what Raphael said about getting to cash quickly is very important, right? And what I say to people is focus, focus, focus. Don't try to do too many things at once. Get one thing right, nail it, continue to make money from that, and then eventually do other things, right? Um, today, we look at examples of companies and we say, oh, well, but Indomie is doing all these different things. Well, Indomie started by just being a distribution company for other noodle manufacturers for years. They built a solid distribution chain before they then went into manufacturing their own noodles, leveraging their own distribution chain, right? But it's easy to forget those stories. There's no overnight success, but you have to just sort of stay at it. Um, and every single thing you add on complicates your own execution. So the more you can simplify your execution, the better for you. Um, and those are my lessons. Um, Finally, I'll leave you with my favorite uh, African proverb. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And to me, this implies a lot of different things. That's also with your team, that's with investors, um, and the ecosystem you build around you. And with everyone, it's about why are you doing what you're doing. Um, so it's a long journey out there. It's difficult raising money. Um, but, you know, stay at it. If you believe in something and you really do believe in it, stay at it and keep pressing away and, um, and hopefully you'll be one of those stories that, um, that's successful. Thank you.